Topping today's news, CARICOM leaders a step closer to assisting Haiti hold free and fair elections. The Crisis Center and Education introducing the Circle of Peace Initiative in schools. And we hear more from Rupert Hayward on the development of a new city of Freeport. Good evening, Bahamas. I'm Jorino Saunders. This is your JCN Evening News, and it is a pleasure to have you join us. Regional leaders met in Georgetown, Guyana at the 46th regular meeting of the Conference of the Heads of Government of the Caribbean. It's also called CARICOM. They discussed a wide range of subjects, and during the closing press conference on Wednesday, Prime Minister of the Bahamas, Philip Davis, was asked to address the issue of Haiti. And after the leaders spent nearly 25 hours of the agenda discussing Haiti, there were some promising results, including a possible date for elections. We are deeply concerned over the continued deterioration of the security, humanitarian and political situation in Haiti. And more importantly, we are more concerned about the continued delay in overcoming the political stalemate to block the possibility of free and fair elections. And say delay because we've been at this now almost two years. Um, I think even prior to the assassination of President Muzi, uh, the CARICOM community had been, has been at this attempting to bring normalcy to Haiti. Prime Minister Davis told CARICOM leaders that Haiti is hemorrhaging, pointing out that there were more murders recorded in Haiti during the month of January than in the war between Ukraine and Russia for the same period. I think it's important to note that at a, in our deliberations, particularly with Prime Minister of Ariel Henry, a number of major steps and concessions were made uh, to move the political process forward including, which we think is a, a significant step forward, holding of general elections to restore constitutional government and authority no later than the 31st of August 2025. We think that was a significant step in the right direction. We also appreciated that to have elections by then, there are what we call, there need to be an assessment as to the infrastructure set up the set up for the purpose of holding those elections. At the CARICOM meeting, Haitian Prime Minister Ariel Henre will travel to Kenya to finalize modalities for the deployment of the multinational security support to Haiti with the Kenyan authorities and other African states. While at the CARICOM meeting in Guyana, Minister of Foreign Affairs Fred Mitchell provided a few details on a meeting between Prime Minister Philip Davis and Brian Nichols, the United States Under Secretary for the Western Hemisphere with responsibilities for the Caribbean relations. He says they discussed a broad range of matters. The Prime Minister Philip Davis is in Guyana. He met with the Under Secretary for Western Hemisphere of the United States State Department, Brian Nichols. He's the top diplomat for relations with the Caribbean to discuss, amongst other things, the travel advisories as it relates to the Bahamas and the issue of relations with the Haitian Republic. Also flagged is the fact that a new airport is coming to Grand Bahama and that a formal request will be made by the Bahamas government to return pre-clearance to Grand Bahama. The U.S. has a seven-year planning cycle, so we're trying to make the request early and make sure it gets into their planning. You know, the FNM made a mistake by allowing the airport to be not to be rebuilt, and uh, we're going to get the job done. Um, and preclearance should return if we do it right uh, from uh, into Grand Bahama. Prime Minister Philip Davis and the Bahamian delegation are expected to be back home by now from Guyana. The Ministry of Education, Technical and Vocational Training in collaboration with the Bahamas Crisis Center launched the Green Ribbon Peace Campaign, which according to the Bahamas Crisis Center Director, Dr. Sandra Dean Patterson, is a multi-level, multi-component initiative that includes creating circles of peace in and around primary schools, speaking with students between the ages of, or between the grades rather, of four and six. Dr. Dean Patterson detailed how parents are also involved in this initiative. We have a, a, a parenting 
um, intervention where we'll provide sensitization to parents because it's no use us letting children know that you need to be kind and you need to be brave. Um, but parents need to understand. So, and you know, many fathers, unfortunately, tell their children, if somebody hits you, what? Hit them back. We don't want that. We want to move away from that. We don't want the culture of violence that is taking over our people. We live next door to a country that boasts about violence being as American as, as apple pie. You know, so they have accepted violence. They accept guns. We don't want to go that direction. And we have to stop our country. Noel Nichols, one of the program's coordinators, went into further detail concerning intervention efforts that will be conducted in schools and expect to make a difference in the lives of primary school children. Myself, working along with um, Rowena Poitier, who's the director of the Bahamas Artist Movement, um, we designed a workshop and trained over 150 volunteers coming from our partner organizations. We're going to be going into 17 different schools simultaneously, um, workshopping with the grade 4 and grade 5 students. Um, and this is going to be a massive operation that's going to t touch over 3,000 primary school children. And in this workshop, what we are going to be doing is teaching the young people what we call to activate their superpowers. Because we want to give them the experience of actually the power of kindness. It takes no money to smile, to say something nice to somebody, to treat somebody with kindness. It takes no money. You know, it takes no um, 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 uh, money to treat somebody with respect and to bring res practice respect in a way that it can it has the power to change an entire scenario and we want to show kids through role playing through discussion through um, some creative activities that we've designed for them the power of these values and what we call their innate superpowers Minister of Education, Technical and Vocational Training, Glennis Hannah Martin, thanked Dr. Dean Patterson for their work at the Bahamas Crisis Center while reiterating that it takes a collected effort to make a change in the lives of young Bahamians. We had, um, well, since I came here, we, we said from the inception, it takes a village. We, we want to move away from this concept that you send your child to school and we're supposed to change the world. You know, because it's not, if it, if, if it could have happened, we would have done it. It's not that simple. And we require the participation and engagement of all stakeholders. The crisis center, the work that they do in this nation is well known. Dr. Patterson talked about its early work and the resistance that was met, and now it's become a staple for um, so many things in this country. And so we are very proud to partner with them. I'm very impressed at the very widespread engagement and, and the, the word, you, your word, massive impact that we expect from this. That was Minister of Education, Technical and Vocational Training, Glennis Hannah Martin. And finally in this segment, after a very challenging set of circumstances and unforeseen events over the past 20 years, Freeport Grand Bahama is now on the cusp of a resurgence and the beginning of a new chapter. This according to Rupert Haywood, principal and director of the Grand Bahama Port Authority. Speaking at the recent Grand Bahama Business Outlook, he detailed several major projects that are expected to help revive the city of Freeport. Today, through the efforts, I will say, of the Port Authority, but also in collaboration with our valued stakeholders, in which I include the government of the Bahamas, the Chamber of Commerce, the residents of the Bahamas and our licensees. Freeport can confidently now speak of investment in excess of $1.7 billion and more like $2 billion as we heard today. This is new investment, not just announcement in the pipeline. It includes $850 million worth of investment in the tourism and hospitality sector, representing nearly 3,500 jobs, so that's temporary jobs, and 1,200 to 1,400 permanent jobs, and hundreds of spin-offs opportunities for Bahamians. It also includes over 30 million worth of investment in renewable energy, 50 million in industry and manufacturing, representing 400 temporary and nearly 200 permanent positions. 
over 200 million in healthcare and medical education, and over 100 million in commercial and residential real estate development, among many, many others. Mr. Hayward noted that although Freeport's population is only one-fifth of that of New Providence, it still contributes nearly $200 million to the public treasury every year, which will only grow once the full potential of the second city is unlocked. He says, we cannot expect the issues that have hampered Freeport for the past 20 years to disappear on their own. The vision is that Grand Bahama can become a world-class business center, a startup hub a digital and digitization laboratory, remote working destination for those in cutting edge industries, an entrepreneurial mecca unrivaled in the region, and an innovation destination. If we get these four pillars right, in my view, we have a blank canvas capable of welcoming and facilitating any industry in the world right here in Grand Bahama. I could list out all of the possibilities, but the truth is there really should be no limit. Mr. Hayward was speaking to an audience that also included Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Tourism, Investments and Aviation, Chester Cooper, and a Minister for Grand Bahama, Ms. Ginger Moxie. We'll take a break here. We'll be right back after these commercials.